This is the exterior of the Hilton Hotel in Washington, D.C. Although it's been nearly 40 years since the event, this looks exactly the same as it did on March 30, 1981, when right here, crazed gunman John Hinckley took out a revolver and started blasting away at the President of the United States, Ronald Reagan, who was standing right in front of him. Reagan had just come out of this hotel after speaking to a labor group and was headed for his limousine parked pretty much right here. Reagan was hit in the left side of his body. Fortunately for him and everyone, the president survived the attack, but it was a very near thing. This was not the last major attempt of an assassination of a sitting U.S. president, but it was the last one that was face-to-face -face and the most serious attempt since the successful assassination of John F. Kennedy in November 1963. Reagan was not the only one hit. A Secret Service agent, Tim McCarthy, a D.C. police officer, Thomas Delahanty, and White House Press Secretary James Brady were also struck, Brady most seriously. Brady was technically killed by this attack, although he died in 2014, some 33 years later, but medical examiners ruled that the injuries he sustained in 1981 were the direct cause of his death, a very tragic consequence. The story of the assassination attempt has been told numerous times in some very good books and some TV documentaries. This video is not about that. Instead, I'd like to engage in some speculation. Thank God Reagan was not killed, but how might history have unfolded if he was just a little more unlucky? And he had been. In this video, we'll examine the question, what if Reagan hadn't survived? Hi, I'm Sean Munger. I'm a historian and I teach history classes online. You can see what I've got at my website, seanmunger.com. If you click on Courses Offered, you'll see I have a course on Vietnam, another one on understanding Vladimir Putin, and a free course on the Pearl Harbor attack. I also have two podcasts, one called Second Decade, the other Green Screen, and you can find them on the major podcatchers. In real life, the Reagan assassination attempt of March 1981, although it did not claim the life of President Ronald Reagan, was a turning point in his life and presidency. Reagan was wounded much more seriously than the White House told the public. His left lung collapsed and he lost half the blood in his body. It took him nearly a year to recover fully. According to historians, his brush with death may have helped galvanize his thinking toward peace and reconciliation with the Soviets. While he was running for president in 1980, Reagan was known as a ferocious cold warrior. So what if all of that didn't happen? If Hinckley's bullet had landed just an inch or so to the left, it would have pierced Reagan's heart. It was a near enough thing as it was, and thanks to the heroic efforts of the doctors at George Washington University Hospital, Reagan survived. This is one of the most consequential near misses in recent American history. In one sense, the question, what would have happened if Reagan didn't make it, is fairly simple. Under the 25th Amendment to the US Constitution, and tradition that had been in place long before that amendment, Vice President George H.W. Bush would have become the nation's 41st president. And historically, we do know a lot about what he would have done as president, because in real life, he did become the 41st president, only after winning election in his own right in 1988. So is this hypothetical question what we historians call a counterfactual? Is it just a nothing burger? Well, not exactly, in my opinion. Uh, we have to look not merely at what Bush would have done as president succeeding Reagan, but we also have to look at what effect the absence of Reagan might have had on American wor and world history. And we can't know, but I think we can make some educated guesses. First, Reagan had been on the job for barely more than two months. Elected in 1980 and inaugurated on January 20th, 1981, if he had died on March 30th, Reagan's term of office would have been the second shortest in American history, surpassed only by the one-month administration of William Henry Harrison, the first president to die in office in April 1841, just 30 days after his inauguration. We can assume that Reagan would have had a grand state funeral and the nation would have been in mourning for some period of time. In real life, Reagan's would-be assassin, John Hinckley, was judged to be insane at the time of the attack and was sentenced not to prison, but to a mental hospital, from which he was released in 2016. I'd venture a guess that if he had been successful in his deranged attempt to kill Reagan, 
which was done to impress the actress Jodie Foster, with whom he was obsessed, the verdict might have gone a different way. There was a lot of outrage as it was that Hinckley got off on an insanity plea, as people uh, characterized it, and in fact the law was changed to make such pleas harder to succeed. Considering that both of the other previous presidential assassins in U.S. history who lived long enough to reach trial, Charles Guiteau, the assassin of James Garfield, and Leon Salgaz, the killer of President William McKinley, both of them were sentenced to death, I'd say it's pretty likely that Hinckley would have suffered the same fate. Another tradition that's usually been observed by presidents who succeed to the office after the death of their predecessors is that they usually keep on the previous president's cabinet. Lyndon Johnson did this after Kennedy's death in 1963, Truman did it in 1945, Andrew Johnson did it in 1865, much to his later regret. I think Bush would have almost certainly retained Reagan's cabinet ministers, and he probably would have tried to honor the legislative and policy priorities that Reagan ran on in 1980 and tried to set in motion in his 60 or so days as president. This is important because one of those priorities was a major tax overhaul, the Economic Recovery Tax Act of 1981, known at the time as the Kemp-Roth Bill. This tax act significantly lowered tax rates, especially on high earners, but it also closed a lot of tax loopholes that had previously existed, and in fact widened the tax base, so in some ways it was a tax increase. In any event, the bill, the lower tax rates in the upper brackets began a process of worsening income inequality that has continued to the present day. Almost certainly, the new President Bush would have gotten this bill through Congress, and he could claim, probably within a few months at most of being on the job, that he had already fulfilled one of Reagan's signature promises. This might have been awkward for Bush. People forget this, but in the 1980 Republican primaries, Bush ran against Reagan. The Kemp-Roth bill represented an economic theory known as supply-side economics, which was a reversal of the economic theory that had undergirded most federal money policy since the New Deal. Bush, at least before he got on Reagan's ticket, was opposed to this, famously calling it voodoo economics, so we can wonder whether his heart would really have been in this kind of policy. Bush, in fact, wasn't even Reagan's first choice as vice president. At the 1980 Republican convention in Detroit, Reagan tried to lure former President Gerald Ford to run on his ticket, trying to make a bizarre deal that would essentially have created a co-presidency between Reagan and Ford. Only when this deal fell apart at the last minute and Reagan realized he had no plan B, did he somewhat reluctantly settle for Bush, whom some sources claim Reagan didn't even like very much. Anyway, the fateful decision to put Bush on the ticket was made in less than 10 minutes in a Detroit hotel room in July 1980, one of the most consequential snap decisions in American history. I talked about this decision in an episode of my podcast, Second Decade. It's one of the bonus off-topic episodes, the first in a series on the history of the 1980s. In any event, we do know historically what what the result of the Economic Recovery Tax Act of 1981 was, a severe recession that plagued the American economy over the next two years and significant ballooning of the federal budget deficit. So I think we can assume that this would have happened on Bush's watch too. As happened with Reagan, Bush's approval ratings probably would have started to creep upwards in 1983 as this recession worked its way through the system. But Bush, who notably lacked charisma and warmth, would probably never have been anywhere near as popular as Reagan was throughout much of his term. Bush was a good administrator, but he wasn't a visionary, and he had a difficult time inspiring people. As we saw in real life in his lackluster 1988 and especially 1992 campaigns, he also had no big ideas for the direction to take the country in and saw his role mainly as a caretaker, not an activist president. It was difficult for him to imagine growing beyond this role. I think these limitations would have had significant historical consequences. Reagan came to power in 1980 at the head of a revitalized conservative movement that managed to unite 
the two competing wings of the Republican Party, the fiscal conservatives who liked stuff like the Kemper-Roth tax bill, and the social and religious conservatives, Jerry Falwell's moral majority, which came out of the culture wars of the late 1970s. Bush, by contrast, was more of what they used to call a country club Republican, from the wealthy white suburbs of New England. He was educated at Andover and Yale and was part of the Eastern establishment. I think he would have had a very hard time remaining as the standard bearer of the new conservatism that Reagan championed in 1980, and which Reagan's biggest fans would have believed, not unreasonably, was stolen from them by the assassination of Reagan only two months into his term. Thus, I don't think we would be talking about a Reagan revolution in an early Bush term. Reagan would probably have been a martyr and a hero to the conservative movement, but more in an aspirational sense, the savior whose big ideas accepting those 1981 tax cuts never got a chance to be tried. I don't think Bush could have held together those two wings of conservatism that Reagan managed to unite in 1980, fiscal conservatives and the culture-slash-religious conservatives. While the election of Reagan would still undoubtedly have been a major milestone in the history of American conservatism, his absence from that movement after 1981 would be very consequential. Looking over the crowd of conservative politicians on the scenes, on the scene in the early 80s, I seriously doubt that anyone could really have filled Reagan's shoes in the sense of being a leader of a movement as opposed to merely the titular head of a political party. The conservative movement as we now know it would probably have developed very differently. That said, I think we can say it's virtually a slam dunk that Bush, running in 1984 for a full term in his own right, would have been elected. Of all the vice presidents who succeeded a deceased predecessor who chose to run in their own right, Teddy Roosevelt, Calvin Coolidge, Harry Truman, and Lyndon Johnson, all of them won their own elections. With the economy going strong again and likely peace abroad, Bush could pretty much count on defeating whoever the Democrats put up against him in 1984. Maybe it would have been Walter Mondale as it was in real life, maybe not. I don't think it matters. So that brings us to the question, how would Bush have done in foreign affairs and especially with the Cold War, which in 1981 was sharpening considerably? In real life, Bush presided over the end of the Cold War, with the fall of the Berlin Wall and ultimately the collapse of the Soviet Union itself. But that occurred 10 years later, and he was, in many cases, in many ways, inheriting a situation that was already in progress under Reagan, whether Reagan deserves the credit for that or not. Though his real term between 1989 and 93 shows that Bush was considerably skilled at foreign policy and especially at building rapports with foreign leaders, he was not a visionary. In 1992, Bill Clinton famously pointed out that Bush mocked the so-called vision thing, which made it impossible for him to be a transformative president. I don't think Bush would have put the same effort that Reagan ultimately did in trying to build a rapport with the Soviets on which to ramp down the Cold War. I'm sure he could have worked effectively with Soviet leaders. It's said that Mikhail Gorbachev especially liked Bush. But Bush lacked the imagination necessary to envision what, what, what would have been needed to significantly alter the basic stance of the Cold War. The Soviet Union collapsed, not so much because of pressure from the West, although the arms race with NATO was a factor, but more because of its own internal decay, especially its economic problems. That still had several more years to play out, and I don't think Bush, if he came to office in 1981, would have significantly accelerated it. Thus, I think Bush would have left office in 1989 with the Cold War still going on. Bush generally ran a tighter ship than Reagan. In, especially in his full term from 1985 to 89, when he could have dispensed with the holdover Reagan advisors and picked his own trusted people like Brent Scowcroft and such, Bush could probably have, ex have successfully avoided some of the traps that Reagan fell into. The Iran-Contra affair would almost certainly never have happened. Bush would never agree to swap arms for hostages. Bush could also have probably resisted Reagan's weird little obsessions from the bizarre SDI Star Wars missile defense idea to his obsession with the Nicaraguan Contras, which led him into the Iran-Contra trap in the first place. Some other things probably would have been different. Bush might have responded differently to the AIDS pandemic, which exploded during the 1980s. 
One of the major historical criticisms of Reagan was that he was indifferent to this, given conservative attitudes toward the LGBT community, which in the early 80s was where the AIDS crisis was being felt most strongly. Bush's Supreme Court would probably have looked very different than Reagan's. My guess is that we probably still would have had Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, but not Scalia or Kennedy. The court might have been more moderate than it turned out to be in real life. Longer term, looking beyond Bush, what might have happened after Bush left office? Having served most of Reagan's term and then one of his own, Bush could not have run again in 1988. The Democrats were moribund during the Reagan years in real life. Bush, with a much weaker hold on the conservative movement, might have faced more spirited opposition from the other side of the aisle. And by 1988, Democrats, I think, could have shaken off the bad associations with the Jimmy Carter years that, in real life, would have to wait until Bill Clinton came along in 1992. So a Bush presidency might well have been followed by the election of a Democratic president in 1988. I strongly doubt that it would have been Bill Clinton, whose career was not really on track yet at that time, and I don't think it would have been Michael Dukakis, who in real life did run on the Democratic ticket that year. Without Bush the first being president at the time he was, and especially without Bill Clinton and Al Gore, could Bush the second have ever found a future in national politics? I think if Bush the first had been president in 1981 rather than 1989, we would never have had Bush the second at all. But that's more of a gut feeling than anything else. Of course, there's no way that we could know. Reagan survived for 23 years beyond the 1981 assassination attempt, and we know the shape that history eventually took. But history is fascinating because if you pull one little thread and skew it just slightly differently, the picture you wind up with can be significantly different. Thanks very much for watching. Please like, subscribe, share, do all the stuff you usually do with a video you like. And I'll be back again soon with more historical thoughts. Thanks.